You know, I had been wanting to show you visuals of the tabernacle. Well, guess what? We built the whole tabernacle years ago. I had a whole conference on it where I was walking, teaching, and showing everything. You know, I looked at a part of it today, like part one that you will see. It is tremendous. The Lord really did mighty things in that conference and especially through that one teaching that I want you to look at today. I think you will benefit way more by listening to this teaching and by watching and seeing the tabernacle with your own eyes. In fact, we had a group of uh, priests carry the Ark of the Covenant in the conference. It was an amazing heavenly moment I'll never forget. And you'll see that because I want to show you, it's actually in three parts. So on part three, you'll see the processional with the Ark of the Covenant coming into the conference. It was a very divine moment. But today, what I want to show you is part one. And, you know, I'll be here with you, of course, here, here and there as I guide you along. But I really think it's good to see with your own eyes the tabernacle so you can kind of comprehend it more. You know, the Chinese said a picture is worth a thousand words. I think really a picture is worth a million words, maybe even more sometimes. So be blessed. I pray the Lord will really reveal things to you today that maybe I'm not able to explain without us seeing it, you know. So let's go right now and be a part of this amazing service that took place a few years back. But you know what? God's word is always in the now. So be blessed today. Tonight, I will begin with a teaching that I believe is of great importance to the Lord and to the church, especially now, for we have so little of the presence of God in many circles today. And God is longing to restore to his church not only his power, but his presence. Now, please understand, before I begin teaching, there's a major difference between God's power and presence. God's presence is what you and I need for living. God's presence is what nourishes you. God's presence keeps you. God's presence transforms you into the image of Christ Jesus. God's power is not for you, it's for others through you. God's power does not change you. God's power does not even nourish you. God's power does not maintain you. God's power doesn't feed you. We are going to understand in this great conference how to enter into God's presence, not God's power. Now, I want you all to listen to what I got to tell you because I speak not only from experience, but I speak from entering into the word of God and understanding it. I can enter into God's power in one second. I can come out in one second. But I cannot enter God's presence in one second, nor come out in one second. God's power was seen by Israel, and yet they wanted to go back to Egypt. God's power was seen for 40 years, and they rejected God. God's power was seen with such awesome wonder. The result was, they said, let's build an animal and call it Jehovah. God's power was seen when Christ Jesus walked the earth and they said, crucify him. 
We're not talking about God's power tonight. And we need God's power. The world needs God's power. The church need, also needs God's power. But that's not what keeps you alive. What keeps you alive is God's presence. God's presence nourishes you. God's presence keeps you. The Bible says in the Psalms, He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto Israel. Well, you know what happened to Israel. But when Moses saw God and experienced God and God revealed his nature to Moses and his heart to Moses and his attributes to Moses and his ways to Moses, Moses was transformed. Uh, the great verse in Exodus 34, 20, 29, and Moses wished not his face had shone. God's presence so transformed him he forgot all about himself. God's presence will cancel you. As it canceled Moses. Moses said to Israel. In fact, the scriptures are clear on the fact that when he stood in the presence of God, he did not know that God's presence was changing and transforming him. He wished not that his face was shining. He wished not. And this is God's great desire for you, that you might be transformed into the image of his son. And so from glory to glory, we are changed. The scripture says, as the glory of God transforms us. I'm going to help you in this incredible time here uh, to understand how to enter into what the glory is. How many won that? Put your hands way up high. Yeah, we want to understand how do we enter into the glory? I can enter into God's power with surrender. And please believe me when I tell you, and I'm not boasting, I can surrender in one second. But to enter into God's presence on that platform, I go through a process. I'm going to take you through here. The tabernacle is the roadmap. The tabernacle is the pattern that God uses. Now, before I help you understand, and it's going to take me three full sessions to help you understand, so don't expect me to all do it in one night. I must help you understand first. The Bible says in Psalm 100 verse 4, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise be thankful unto him and bless his name now you must understand before you can enter into the presence of God you must experience the gate we enter into his gates with thanksgiving say thanksgiving now, whenever the Bible talks about thanksgiving, it talks about goodness. It's related to God's goodness. A whole lot of people thank God every day, but have no idea how to enter into God's presence. And when we talk about the gates, we talk about introduction. We talk about salvation. When you and I were introduced to Christ Jesus, I have to go back to 1972 to help you understand what I experienced. And you have to go back to the day you were saved to understand what we are going to talk about here. When you were born again, you came first to the gate. You were introduced to Christ Jesus and you met him first as the savior of your soul you met him first as the king of glory you met him first as the man Christ and you met him first as the son of God if you had not experienced him in all four revelations, you could not have been saved. Salvation 
is impossible till you understand the four offices of the master. Now, if you look at the gate, you notice four colors, the white, the blue, the scarlet, the purple. These four colors, God said to Moses, are to be at the gate. Now, nobody really knows what it looked like exactly. We can only guess. Most likely they were mingled rather than separated. But these colors represent Christ in his fullness. In his fullness at salvation. Not his fullness beyond salvation. If you missed what I said, I'll say it again and help you understand. When, when, whenever we meet the Lord, we meet him in completion and we think that's all there is. But as we progress in that revelation of Christ, we come to another image of him in completion again. And then to another image of him in completion. There are seven Listen, there are seven revelations of Christ I'm going to take you through before you can worship God. Seven before you can experience the presence of God. I know people may not understand this, but it's a fact in my life. I experience all seven in every service I've ever had in the world. You say, what do you mean? I'm glad you asked. I'll help you understand that. But you got to stay with me till tomorrow night. And the people said, Amen. the first revelation is his offices. The second revelation is his cross. The third, his word. And then we'll go beyond that till we see the seventh. Amen. But let's talk about introduction. Say with me, introduction. Now, the minute you experience that introduction, you've experienced Christ Jesus as the man you identify with. You've, I, you've, you've experienced Christ Jesus at salvation and began to identify with him. And this is why he was baptized. For he said to John the Baptist, we must fulfill all righteousness. The minute Christ Jesus was baptized, he identified himself with sinful humanity. We identify with him as the man Christ Jesus. Now, we go on, all happening at the time of salvation, the Holy Spirit reveals him then to us as the Savior. The Savior is the scarlet. The Savior is the man, Christ, who died on the cross and shed his blood for me and took my sin upon himself. And then we experience this precious Jesus in another revelation. The Son of God, the blue. And there we begin to obey him and worship him and praise him and exalt him. See, there are those that have only seen him as the, as, the, as the man, Christ Jesus, and therefore their relationship doesn't last. They fall away. But if you have the full revelation of Christ, you'll never leave him. Now you've experienced him as the man, Savior, now the Son of God, but then as the King, The purple. God said to Moses, I want those four colors at the gate. The minute we experience the gate, the minute we experience the fullness of Christ Jesus, we then are born again. And that is when thanksgiving erupts out of our souls for his goodness. His goodness, therefore, is related to my salvation. At salvation, I met him as 
man, son of God, savior, king of glory. Amazingly, if we want to put it in the order of the gospels, for these four, four colors also represent the gospels. We have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Amazingly, in Matthew, he's represented to us as king. In Mark, man. In Luke, Savior, John, Son of God. So when you read the Gospels, what do you receive? You receive the revelation of who Jesus is. He's the king in Matthew. He's the man in Mark. The Savior in Luke, Son of God in John. So four colors, four Gospels, four revelations. That all happens at salvation. So if I say to you, Matthew, you must remember he's the king. If I say to you, Mark, he's the man. Luke, my savior. John, son of God. Now, if I say Matthew, you'll think about the king and the king you obey. I say Mark, the man that I can identify with. Luke, he's the savior that took my sin. Son of God, I worship him. So these are the four revelations. Now I can spend much more time on this, but there's no need because I believe you do understand. And the people said, yes. now once you experience Jesus in these offices, there will be thanksgiving. There will be thanksgiving and you'll thank him for his goodness and his goodness is related to salvation. He saved my soul. Now, that, ladies and gentlemen, that blessed revelation comes at salvation, and there by the Holy Spirit, you meet Jesus Christ face to face. And that's what the psalmist meant when he said, I will enter into his gates. Now, I'll explain something to you later further. Because we must still come to Jesus before we enter into God's presence every single time. In my meetings around the world, I won't even move till I come to Jesus. I cannot begin a service till I have seen him face to face and met him. I must see him before I can minister. And that to me is one of the most amazing and one of the greatest revelations that every believer needs to live and live the kind of life that pleases God Almighty. So I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise. Now, the courts, by the way, we don't really have a whole lot of space between the gate and the altar, but the courts are just between the gate and the altar. So, thanksgiving, praise. Now, sadly, this is as far as some people have gone in their relationship. Because they have misunderstood. They have not yet understood the fact that praise simply gets you in. Praise only allows you in and you can't really praise until you've received Christ Jesus as Savior and have known him in four offices. The scripture says, in Psalm 100, verse 4, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Now, precious people, listen to me. Whenever we praise the Lord, we praise him for his greatness. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, the scripture says. You can read this in Psalm 95, verse 3, in Psalm 145, verse 3. Now, Tonight, though, I want to help you understand worship, and worship is related to the presence of God. Now, listen carefully. I can thank the Lord 
without a revelation, because thanksgiving is the utterance of the mouth. I can praise the Lord without a revelation. Praise is the utterance of the mouth, but I cannot worship him without a revelation. So something happens, something happens between the gate and the altar. Between the gate and the altar, there comes a revelation. And without that revelation, nobody can get any closer. Holiness is a revelation. You must understand, goodness does not need a revelation. You just see what God has done for your life. He saved your soul, cleansed you, set you free, and so forth. And you thank him for his goodness that he's done in your life. You praise him for the power he's displayed to set you free. His greatness, that doesn't need need any revelation. You can see it, you can hear it, you can taste it, you've experienced it. But God's holiness, something different. God's holiness demands a revelation by the Holy Spirit. And only when I've experienced that revelation can I begin to worship him. How can I worship someone whom I have not met? Worship demands a revelation. And this is where we miss it. But how many here are ready to receive it? Say amen. Amen. Now, precious people, turn with me to Isaiah 60 for a second. Isaiah 60, verse 18. In fact, Jim, I'm going to help. Uh, I'm going to have you help me. If you'll take this microphone. And I want you to read for me this amazing verse. Because the word of God declares that when you begin to praise the Lord... When your life has been transformed by his power, and I emphasize his power, when your life has been declared free, violence leaves your life. The word of God declares, Isaiah 60, verse 18, if you will please, Jim, thank you. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. Now, this is amazing because true salvation brings to true liberty, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. There will be no violence. The enemy of your soul will not display his power any longer in your life. There will be no destruction. There will be no waste. Dear God, I pray you're listening. The minute you are born again, true, true Christianity clearly states, if you are in Christ, old things are passed away. If you are a true believer, there will be no bondage in your soul. There will be no bondage in your life. The chains of hell would have broken the minute you saw Christ in his four revelations. But today, that's not reality, sadly. Even though that's what the Bible says, you and I are to live in. Today, precious believers come into the kingdom still with the chains of yesterday around their neck. But the Bible says, true praise true praise happens when a man has been delivered from violence destruction and waste therefore demonic powers are something from the past not the present i have not had one day of bondage since the holy ghost touched my life that's a fact Now, I will tell you something else. When I was saved in 1972, I did not know the power of God like I know it today. Between 72 and 73, I was in trouble. I didn't walk in liberty. I walked where most Christians walk today. I had to go to Maxwell White and watch him set the captives free by applying the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. When the power of God came on me in Catherine's meeting, from that day till now, I have not known one second of bondage. 
I have not known one minute of depression, oppression, or any or any shun. I'm free. How can I give away what I have not gotten? How can I minister to the captives if I'm captive? How can I pray for the sick if I am bound? How can I give what I don't have? My friends, I've experienced it. Whom the Son set free is free indeed. Is that what you want? Hello, is that what you want? It is not by might, not by power, not by preaching, not by education, and not by learning, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You can't learn this stuff. You can't learn it. You can go to school and become a Bible scholar, and all you have is information. Information will not help you. We are not after knowledge. We are after Jesus. I am not interested in knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. I want the knowledge of him. The Bible doesn't tell us to seek knowledge. What will happen to you if you get knowledge puffed up? That's all you get is a big mind, big head. Okay, get knowledge. Get all the knowledge you want. You're gonna, all you're going to do, all you're going to do is be so educated, there'll be no room for God in your life. You missed it. Some people are so educated, God can't get in. They leave him no space. Some are so educated, God cannot use them. I'm not against education. I want revelation, not education. Education will destroy me. Revelation will transform me. God's word is a revelation of himself. Say revelation. Say it again. Say the knowledge of him is revelation. So when I read the Bible, I am not looking for information. I'm looking for Jesus. I look for Jesus in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers. I look for Jesus. I'm looking for, for every time I read, I look for Jesus. And the greatest revelation God gave me years ago is that the Bible is a revelation of one person and his name is Jesus. The greatest revelation I ever had as a young man living in Canada is the fact that the Bible is a revelation of one man. That's it. From Genesis to Revelation, it reveals Jesus. I'm not looking for knowledge. I'm looking for the knowledge of Christ. And the people said, yes. now, the minute you receive this Jesus, there will be freedom. There will be liberty. Now, I know in some cases, people have not experienced that. But that's what I've read in this precious word. And that's what our hearts cry for. Absolute liberty in Christ Jesus. I thank him for that goodness. I praise him for his greatness. And that only lets me through the gate. Now I stand before an altar. But before I talk about the altar, I mentioned earlier the importance of revelation. Holiness is a revelation. Now, you can say to God, you're merciful. That does not describe his fullness. You're loving still. You don't describe his fullness. You're gracious doesn't describe his fullness. You're kind doesn't describe his fullness. But when you say you're holy, holiness is his total being. Uh, did you miss what I said? Say after me, holiness is the total being of God. 
Say it again. So when I say to the Lord, you are holy, I'm saying you are love, you are justice, you are anger, you are wrath, you are mercy, you are grace, your power, your eternity. In that word holy is his totality. That's why the angels don't say you're gracious, merciful, and kind. They say holy, 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 because the word holy is his totality. Holiness is a revelation. Say that. Say it again. See, the Bible, the scripture says clearly, the scripture says clearly that uh, God is love, 1 John 4. God is justice, Deuteronomy 32. Uh, amazingly, God is wrath, 2. Nahum 1, 2. Uh, God is mercy. He's merciful, Psalm 51, 1. God is gracious. He's grace, Hebrews 4, 16. God is power, Psalm 93. Now, all these things represent a portion of him. We see, uh, 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 if, if, if I may say it, a, a measure of him. But not his totality until we know his holiness. His holiness reveals his heart. His holiness reveals him. And only that revelation will produce, will birth, will literally bring to pass worship in your life. Anybody understands? If you do, put your hands way up high so I know I'm not wasting my time. Now, holiness, precious people, not only is holiness a revelation, but that revelation begins amazingly there at the altar of sacrifice. This is where its revelation begins to unfold. I know tonight I'm saying things and I'm saying I'm fast. And I know you're trying to catch on, but it's quite simple, really. Once you meet Jesus as Savior, you're through the gate. At that moment, a revelation must come to your life on who is this Jesus that you've, that you've met. The Bible says he's eternal. The word of God in Psalm 95, go with me please to Psalm 95, tells me something uh, most remarkable. Oh, this is glorious. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Great. The Bible says the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills are his also. The sea is his. He made it. His hands form the dry land. Now, amazingly, all that happens before I receive the revelation of who God is. All I've seen now is his power and greatness from verse 1 right to verse 4 and 5. The Bible is clear. The word of God states clearly, you come into his presence with a joyful noise. You are crying with praise and thanksgiving, making a joyful noise, for you've seen he's a great God, great king above all gods. You've seen in his hands are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands form the dry land. And there you stop. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, moon and the stars, I cry, what is man? That brings me into praise, but not into worship. Worship demands a revelation. I can praise him by the things I see. I can praise him by the things I hear. I praise him for what he has done, his goodness, his greatness. I can't worship him until I see who is this God. And so the Bible says, O oh, come, let us worship, verse 6, and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. And now something happens. Are you ready for this? If you are, say yes. yes. Now, precious people. I 
I want to say something here that uh, I've got to I've got to make sure you hear it. I've said to you earlier, I can thank him, I can praise him, and don't need a revelation. But beyond that, I got to have one to worship him. I can thank him and I can praise him, and I don't hear his voice in that. There is no voice in praise. There is no voice even in thanksgiving, because all it's my voice, not his. But I cannot worship God. Not one time can you worship God without experiencing his voice. His voice is not heard at the gate. And his voice is not heard in the court. His voice is heard when worship begins. Remember I said to you earlier, Thanksgiving is the utterance of the mouth and praise, utterance of the mouth. But the minute worship really begins, after this revelation comes to you, who is this God I'm worshiping? And that revelation begins at the cross. This is why we have, we must, we must, we must come to the cross. If we bypass the cross, we'll never receive the revelation of who God is. The Bible says, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. He is our God. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now it says, today, if you will hear his voice. This tells me that I cannot hear his voice in thanksgiving. And I cannot hear his voice in praise. But I must in worship. Worship, therefore enables me and enables you to hear the voice of the shepherd. Oh, hallelujah. The Bible tells me very clearly that worship, which begins with a revelation, this worship brings not only his voice, but more than that, rest. The Bible goes on to say, harden not your heart as in the provocation, day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years long, was I grieved with this generation and said, it's a people that do err in their heart. They have not known my ways. Notice, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. All right, let me have your attention, please. Are you still there? I said, are you still there? There is rest in worship. There is rest in worship. There were, therefore, worship is my Sabbath. When I begin to experience worship, this is my Sabbath. This is my rest. This is the place when I am delivered from work. You've got to hear what I'm telling you here. Therefore, there is a day of rest for the people of God. You see, in Hebrews, when you read Hebrews, you, you find something most revealing. God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. Now, God promised a day of rest for Israel, but they could not find it, for they did not believe his word. They could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief kept them from entering into the Sabbath, the real Sabbath. Now, when you and I speak of Sabbath, we think Saturday. It's a day of the week. When God says Sabbath, he says rest. Rest means you don't have to work. God will do it all. Rest means you stand and see his power. Rest, you stand and let the Lord do all that must be done. He's the man of war. He'll fight your battles. All you do is rest and let God do it. But the Bible now says Israel refused that rest. Therefore, in David, he spoke again and said, there remains a day, another day, a third day for the people of God. 
In Adam, God rested. Creation, God rested. Israel, he offered them one day and they said no. For why? They didn't believe. But God in David spoke again and said there remains another day. And that day comes by faith. Anybody understands what I just said? Our life of faith brings us into that rest. But precious people, it is worship and only worship that gets us in. So, you meet Jesus Christ. He becomes your Savior, your Lord, your Master, your King. You're in and you thank Him. Now you praise Him for all He's done. And you haven't even yet understood this amazing place called the cross. The minute you come to the altar and God said to Moses, build a brazen altar. This brazen altar represents the sufferings of Christ Jesus. God said to Moses, I want you to build this brazen altar. And it speaks of the blood. But please listen to me. This is where worship is born. Worship is born at the cross. Because at that cross, something happens. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice. We hear his voice as we begin entering into his presence. And we cannot enter into his presence till we come to the cross. The cross, if I may say, is the door into the presence of God. The gate is the door into the Christian life, but the cross is the door into God's presence. We enter through the gate, we're through that place called introduction, and there we thank him, and there we praise him, but we're not really in yet. We're dry and young, and hand heard his voice. All we know is what he's done for us, and sadly, there's a whole lot of people living in the courts. I haven't heard his voice yet. And it's his voice that will transform you. Remember, Israel rejected his voice. And that's why transformation did not come their way. And they said, let's build a calf. Let's go back to Egypt. They rejected his voice. But when you come to that place and worship is born... And worship is born as God reveals his holiness. Worship is born as holiness is revealed and suddenly you see him. The minute you see him, suddenly something happens inside of you. Every true believer has had such a moment. When Jesus becomes all in all to you. Suddenly, there's a revelation of who this precious one is. And in worship, something happens. Praise can stir the soul. Worship stills it. Praise stirs the emotions. Worship stills the emotions. Praise activates the soul. Worship shuts it down. Now there is something that happens here that is incredible. Now, if you're ready, I want you just for 60 seconds to lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on, people. Lift your voices and pray in the Spirit. Everyone lift your voice and pray. Come on. Worship is born. Come on, people, pray. Keep praying, people. Because we want God to do something for us here. This is not just a teaching. We want to experience what we're talking about here. Now all of us have been to the 
to the gate. We all know Jesus. We've met Jesus. We, we, we've experienced thanksgiving. We've experienced praise. Our eyes have seen. Our ears have heard. We've all had a revelation of who Jesus is. But, but now the process must begin. Keep praying. We come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, Jesus. Into your course with praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart.
Father God. Prepare your people's hearts now, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name to enter in. They might experience your word tonight that's being taught. In the name of Jesus and God's people said, take your seats, Hebrews chapter 9. Then very the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table of showbread, which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Say after me, the way into the holiest. Lift your hands and say it again. One more time. Now Hebrews chapter 8 verse 4 and 5, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Say with me the pattern. Say it again. Say it again. Hebrews 9, 23, 24. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Say after me, figures of the true. Say it again. Say it again. Now, precious people, if you look at this tabernacle tonight, we've just read, this is a roadmap. This is a pattern. This is the figure of the true. There is, therefore, a heavenly tabernacle and all that Moses built was simply a pattern a shadow of a true heavenly tabernacle I'm here tonight to show you 
through this pattern, through this roadmap, how to enter into the presence of God. So now lift your hands to heaven and ask the Lord to help you. Because I can teach it and I can preach it, but only God can reveal it. And the people said, now, first of all, we see an altar. Notice that this altar has four horns. Each horn represents an experience of the believers. Every one of these horns is important. There are no meaningless details in the Bible. These horns represent forgiveness. Number one, please write them down, then I'll explain them to you. For the Bible clearly states in Romans 3.25, we are forgiven. These horns represent deliverance from sin and the power of sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, these horns represent the death of the old life. Romans 6.6. 6. But more than that, the Bible tells us in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, that we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable worship. Brethren, he says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Now, this altar represents the cross. It speaks of the cross of Jesus Christ where the blood for my salvation and yours was shed. More than that, this speaks of my death and yours. The gate speaks of Jesus and his fullness and the altar speaks of his cross, his blood. It also speaks of my death. Where I die and I surrender to his will, and I surrender my life completely to him. This is the place of total dedication and total death. Now, this is one of the most important places I can bring you to, precious people of God. We read earlier in Hebrews chapter 9, as the writer to the Hebrews began to describe to us this pattern, this roadmap, and he introduced to us the holy place and the holy of holies. He said little about the outer court. So there is the outer court wherein is the altar of sacrifice and the labor, which I'll speak about in a few minutes. And then there is the holy place wherein stands the lampstand, table of showbread, and the altar of incense. And then there is the holy of holies wherein is the ark of the covenant. It's an amazing scripture we read and maybe you missed it where the writer to the Hebrews declares in Hebrews chapter 9 that the altar of incense stood within the Holy of Holies, yet the Old Testament doesn't tell us that. I want to point that out to you. Please, one more time, Hebrews chapter 9, the Bible says, verse 3, and after the second veil, the tabernacle. Now, when we talk about the tabernacle, we mean the entire structure. When the Bible talks about the tabernacle, it speaks of two departments only and specifically one. Look at me, please, if you will. When we say tabernacle, we mean the whole structure, outer court, holy place, uh, and holy of holies. When the Bible talks about the tabernacle, it talks about the holy place and the holy of holies, which were totally covered with four different type of skins, which are not here on the platform, of course. Otherwise, you won't see what's within. 
The outer skin was badger skin. Badger skin is a very ugly looking skin. The world, when someone stood outside, he could not see beyond the gate, beyond the fence. All he saw is the top of the actual tabernacle, and he saw the ugliness rather than the beauty of the Lord. For remember, when the world sees him, there's no beauty in him they should desire. Only those who are in see the glory. You can't see the, the glory from outside. Now, the word of God clearly states that the tabernacle is the actual holy place and holy of holies, but specifically the holy of holies. Now, in verse 3, we have something very revealing, and often we miss it in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it's clear that the altar of incense is in the holy place, yet the book of Hebrews tells me that the altar of incense stood inside the holy of holies. So which is it? Because here it says very clearly, after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid. Now, here's what I believe really happened. I believe that this scripture speaks of what happened after the veil was split in two. Prior to the veil being split in two, this altar of incense stood outside the Holy of Holies. Now that the veil was split in two because of the death of Christ, most likely and most possibly, this incense was carried within the veil. But I'll tell you frankly, it was so close to the, to the veil that the veil itself was touched by the incense of the smoke. The incense, which I'll discover later and I'll talk about later with you, it speaks of the intimacy with Christ Jesus. It happens just before you and I walk in. But you cannot bypass the altar. This altar of sacrifice is where the blood of Jesus was shed. And you must understand this is where he offered his life. Now, when you come to Christ Jesus, there will come to you a revelation of the work of the cross. There will come to you a revelation of the sufferings of Jesus. And this is where so many of us, when we hear this, we turn away. We are not sure if we understand it. We're not sure if we even want it. But listen to what he said. That I may know him, Paul declared in Philippians 3 and verse 10. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. There is a place where you come in Christ Jesus where you literally surrender completely to the master. In that surrender, you will understand his forgiveness. You will understand deliverance from the power of sin. You'll experience the death of the old man. And you'll experience Romans 12, where you'll yield to him your members, as Paul tells us to do. This is such a holy place, because at the moment of death, something is born. At the moment you and I surrender to the master, something is born in our hearts. What is born? A revelation. That revelation I talked about earlier, where the holiness of God is revealed. The minute you yield, the minute you surrender your body a living sacrifice, there will be, believe me, there will be a revelation at that minute of who this Jesus truly is. The man of sorrows acquainted with grief. This precious redeemer will reveal himself to you and a blessed fellowship will be born and begin. Now, 
When that happens, you come to that place called sanctification. Introduction, sanctification. And sanctification is the second revelation into the presence of God. There has got to be a death. When I stand on those platforms around the world, I promise you before the God I serve, first, there comes to me an absolutely most amazing experience during worship. And I've said this many times, and I don't know whether anyone here fully comprehends this, but I'm sure you do. Before I begin to truly worship, I can sing. But I tell you the truth, I can't worship till this experience happens. I can lead praise. But the minute Jesus, the son of the living God, becomes real to me. When Jesus becomes real to me, I come back to the gate. The process truly begins all over again. But in that blessed moment... I yield. It's so easy to surrender when Jesus is there. It's so easy to yield when the Lord is real. It's so difficult to yield when you do not have that reality. And that minute I yield to the Lord my complete body. I heard Catherine Kuhlman years ago talk about this experience of death and I had no clue what she was talking about. When she said, I die every time I minister, and I had no idea what she's talking about. What does she mean by dying? I was so immature in those early days. Believe me, I used to go pray, Lord, kill me, because I had no idea what she was saying. But I understand now what death really means. Death means you surrender. You yield, and you not only yield your body, you yield your mind, you yield your will, you yield every part of you to the Lord. That happens at that altar. The minute I yield to the Lord, something most remarkable happens. And my brother, it will happen in your life. And my sister, it will happen in your life. The second I yield, and only when I yield, I'm cleansed, I'm washed, I'm liberated, I'm free. And there is where the word of God becomes alive. I can preach this Bible and sometimes precious people, we preach it because we know it. But other times because we've yielded, we preach it. It carries the anointing with it. Why? We've yielded. The second you yield, you come to the laver. Now notice that the laver looked like a cup and saucer. They filled it with water. The word of God. It was made from mirrors that women use to look at themselves. Exodus 38, 8 says that God told Moses to make it out of brazen bronze used by women to look at themselves. That's why James 1, 23 calls the word of God a mirror. You and I look through that mirror every time you read God's precious word. Now, God's precious word is what washes you. God's precious word is what cleanses you. God's precious word is what truly purifies your being. Now, please, precious people, you must understand where we're coming to because it is beyond that blessed place that we come to what is called the door. And I can't really discuss this tonight because we're going to have to wait till tomorrow morning. But you must understand the place that the labor holds. This labor that speaks of God's precious word. Turn with me, if you will. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 25. Because God's word reveals our inward condition, our spiritual condition, and cleanses us. 
It's God's cleansing agent. At the altar of sacrifice, there's redemption. That's sanctification. But at the word, there's cleansing. And that cleansing is vital and we cannot bypass it. So in Ephesians chapter 5, and I want to begin reading at verse 25 and 26 and 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. It is the word of the living God that prepares us to enter into what is called the tabernacle. At the gate, we meet Jesus in all four offices and we're born again. At the altar of sacrifice, speaks of the cross, we surrender and we yield our lives and the power of forgiveness, deliverance from sin, deliverance from the old man, yielding all to him becomes reality. Now we face the labor, the place of cleansing, where the word of God begins to wash our being completely. And you read that precious word of God literally, and you can experience its cleansing power. Not only does it reveal your inward condition, as James 1 declares more than that, Ephesians says, you'll be cleansed, you'll be sanctified. God Almighty will begin to use you as a vessel of honor as a result. Our precious people, tonight I began by helping you understand something extremely important. Because the outer court is the place where the gate, the altar, and the labor are revealed. Now, before I let you go, I got to help you understand something because the tabernacle not only represents Jesus in seven revelations, of which I only gave you three here tonight, but this also represents your life and mine, body, soul, and spirit. Because when I was born again, when I met Jesus as Savior, it is at that moment I was delivered from sin. And then I yielded my body and my life. And I was cleansed by his precious word. But something happens here quite remarkable. The disrobing of the flesh takes place. This is where the flesh no longer holds power over your life. This is where you experience liberty from your greatest enemy. Look, I do not fear the devil, and I don't fear men. I fear this flesh. This flesh has got to die, and it's a daily, daily death. Now, tomorrow, I will take you beyond this place into the holy place in the morning, where we will cover what happens beyond the door. What happens beyond the flesh dying and the flesh yielding? Because the process of worship begins when I die. The process of worship really begins when I yield my body a living sacrifice. For Romans 12 says that clearly it's that place of where the worship of God begins. But then after that, I enter in, but when I enter in, something happens in the soulish realm. The three pieces of furniture represent my mind, my will, and my emotions. And that I'll explain tomorrow morning. And tomorrow night, the Ark of the Covenant and what it represents in your life. And tomorrow night, we're going to do something very special as the priests will carry the Ark 
into this room in a spectacular moment as we begin the service. Now close your Bibles and please stand. Somebody say hallelujah. I am so excited to talk to you about what we're doing with the This Is Your Day programs, the Crusades, the programs from OCC. Our tapes were wearing out and we want to preserve them for our children and grandchildren. So we began to digitize the This Is Your Day programs that many have watched, the Great Crusades of the Past, OCC's programs, conferences, and so much more. And what we are looking at is really amazing. The technology today is remarkable. Let's watch together and see what our staff has been doing. And then I'll talk to you a little more. Watch this. I see a lady with cancer. You have breast cancer. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that cancer in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Uh, someone with diabetes being healed. I rebuke that diabetes in the name of the Lord. And a neck injury is being healed. I rebuke it in Jesus' blessed name. Lord, anoint everyone watching. Did you see the change from the old look to the new look? I mean, it's very evident. It's costing us thousands of dollars to renew all the old programs. So now our children, our grandchildren can be blessed. You know, the anointing still rests amazingly on these services as you see them. So will you stand with me today to help us just digitize everything from way back in the 70s right to the present to make sure everything we have is right and the way it should look. So I pray the Lord will speak to you and I'm going to pray with you that the Lord will bless you for whatever gift you give for this. It's a lot of money, but I believe every tape will be done and we're already doing it, but we need more help from you wonderful partners. The information is on the screen for you. You can go to our website. You can go on the platform you're watching me on or simply text BHM45777 with your gift. Lord, bless your people. Honor them, reward them, prosper them, and use these tapes for years to come for your glory. In Jesus' name, and God's people said amen and amen. Thank you, and I'll see you again tomorrow.